Hare Krishna, welcome to Bhakti Sangha Chepa Hello. Conference Call. Today we are very fortunate to have His Holiness Chandra Moli Swami Maharaj to enlighten us on topic of Shri, glories of Lord Shiva. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to you Maharaj. Please take over the call. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Krishna Bhutane Shri Bhakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamne Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Here we say Sasunya Vadi Paskatya De Sutarine Panchakalpa Tiru Vestya Kripa Sindhu Veva Chapatita Nam Pavane Vyo Vaishnava Vyo Namaha Sai Sri Krishna, Chaitanya, Fuga Gananda, Sri Advaita Gadatha, Arsi Vasari, Gaur, Bhakti Vrindam, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. So there is the uh, celebration of Shiva Ratri, opportunity in our temples around the world. We usually set aside this day for speaking about Lord Shiva. Um, Lord Shiva is uh, quite a complex subject matter, a personality. Complex because he plays many roles. He plays the role as a demigod. He is also in the role as a Vaishnava. He is also in the role of the a supreme controller. He plays many roles. And, it's very hard to get people to agree about Lord Shiva because everything they say is usually coming from one of the different definitions that apply to his qualities and his activities. He's also worshiped by the demons in the role of a demigod and gives material benefits to demons. Um, for us, he is uh, Vaishnava Yada Sambhu in the 12th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. There is a verse and it describes four principles of Vaishnava culture. And I'll, uh, I'll read those four as soon as I bring up the verse here. Uh, Nimda Ganga Yada Ganga Devanam Achutavayam Vaishnavanam Yada Shambhu Yada Tataha Srimad Bhagavatam is Amalam Puranam. I'll give you a more clear description of that particular verse. Well, Here is something the devotees posted. But um, let me find the verse here. It's actually the it's in the very it's in the thirteenth chapter of the twelfth canto. But I have it here, so I'll just read it for you. Let's see. Well, actually, I don't have it. But it's there. It's somebody, you can put up Canto 12, Chapter 13, verse number 16. You can find that particular verse and post it on the screen. Hare Krishna Maharaj, can you see it on the screen? Let me see. Uh, yeah. Okay. Nimna Ganga Yata Ganga Devanam Achuta Yata Vaishnava Yata Shambhu Prananam Vidam Tataha. Just as the Gang Ganga is the greatest of rivers, Lord Achuta is the supreme among deities, and Lord Shambhu, Shiva, the greatest Vaishnava. 
So Srimad Bhagavatam is the greatest of all Puranas. So this verse comprises four glorifications of four different aspects of the absolute truth. And here we got, out of all the Vaishnavas, Shiva is the most great. And there are many, many pastimes which illustrate his greatness as a Vaishnava. I'd like to uh, just speak a little bit about some of the some of the position of Lord Shiva from the perspective of the spiritual realm. Um, there is a personality in the pastimes of Lord Chaitanya. He's one of the Panchatattva. His name is Advaita Acharya. Advaita Acharya is a combination of Mahavishnu and Sadashiva. Sadashiva is the original Shiva who is the Shiva in the spiritual world. Shiva is a post as opposed to a personality. There is the original Shiva, which combined with Mahavishnu to manifest his pastimes in this material world as Lord Chaitanya's associate, uh, Advaita Acharya. So that is Sadashiva. And sometimes Shiva is called, from that perspective, he's called the father of all living entities. So you might, you know, try to understand why is Shiva called the father of all living entities. It's because it's interesting, he takes part in the process of creation. When the Lord wants to manifest the upcoming manifestation of creation, prior to that, all of the living entities exist within the body of Mahavishnu. They're there for what is called the interim period. The interim period is between the manifestations of creation. During that time, the living entities who are in the material existence merge back into the body of, of Mahavishnu and stay there until the next creation appears. So when that creation appears, it's a function to bring it about. And there is a glance coming from Mahavishnu. He glances towards what is called Pradhan. Pradhan is the aggregate of all the material elements that are in a well, we, yeah, aggregate state or a state of not moving. They're all bunched up like an like a, um, egg. And sometimes it's also called Harani Garbha, the golden egg. And the Lord will glance in that direction. That, that glance is carried by his um, internal consort, the manifestation of Lakshmi Devi known as Rama Devi. Rama Devi carries that glance to the Pradhan, which once it connects with the Pradhan, it activates the Pradhan and all the living entities, I'm sorry, all the material elements that start to move. Now in that glance, there are three elements. One is the living entities, Two is the time factor. The time factor inspires the material energy to move. And the third one is Sadashiva. So that glance, which is like a, a golden halo, is actually non-different than Shiva. So that's why Shiva is referred sometimes as the father of all living entities because he takes part and he assists Lord Vishnu in the process of creation. There is a verse from the um, uh, Brahma Samhita which says, Shiram yatata hitikarya vishesha yoga sanjayate natata pata trahesti hetu Yad shambhutam matitata sambhupaiti karyad govindam adhipurusham damaham bhujami 
Just as milk is transformed into curd by the action of acids, but yet the effect of curd is neither the same as nor different from its cause, milk. So I adore the primeval Lord Govinda, of whom the state of Shambhu is a transformation for the performance of the work of destruction. So Shiva is actually non-different than Sh Krishna, Vishnu. So when Vishnu wants to perform the activity of destruction, he manifests himself as Lord Shiva. But the potencies are not the same because Shiva comes in contact with the material energy, which, which Vishnu does not. And we have the story in the Srimad Bhagavatam in the 10th canto, where one personality, his name was uh, Vikrasura. Vikrasura was obviously what he is, a Sora. He was a demon. And he was a very, what we say, crafty demon. He had, wor he had worshipped Lord Shiva with tremendous, tremendous austerities. Um, and in those austerities, he uh, was cutting off his flesh and chanting mantras in glorification of Lord Shiva by throwing the flesh into a fire. In other words, really heavy austerities, wanting Lord Shiva to appear so he could request a benediction. And Lord Shiva is very kind. So he came, uh, not because he was forced to come, but because he wanted he didn't want the demon to kill himself through these austerities. And so he appeared and he said, what do you want? Uh, the demon could ask for anything, but because he's a demon, he doesn't know anything. Only thinks in terms of destruction. So he said to Lord Shiva, I want the benediction that whoever's head I touch will immediately crack it to pieces. Shiva was kind of doubtful, but he gave it to him anyway, because another name for Lord Shiva is Asutos. Asutos means one who is easily pleased and easily angered. That is a name for Lord Shiva. And so somehow or other, he became pleased and he awarded him that benediction. But the demon now was thinking, now that he had the power, he was looking towards Parvati and he wanted to get rid of Shiva. So he came at Shiva with the idea to touch the head of Shiva. Now Shiva saw the demon acting in this way and he, he ran, he departed and the demon pursued him. And it's described in the Bhagavatam. He pursued him for quite a while. And then after some point, Lord Shiva ran past Lord Vishnu and the, demon all, and the demon also was following. When Lord Vishnu saw that his, his devotee, Lord Shiva, was in trouble, he stopped the demon and said, my dear sir, why are you chasing Lord Shiva? Well, he's given me this benediction that anyone's head I touch will crack into pieces, so I'm going to try it on Lord Shiva. And using his power of illusion, the Lord has that power, he can bewilder anyone. He said, uh, you know, Lord Shiva has not been well lately, so he's given out benedictions that don't work. So, and you can see, just touch your own head and you'll see it doesn't work. So with the power of Yoga Mahamaya, the demon, touched his own head and it cracked into pieces and he was finished and Lord Shiva was saved. And then Lord Shiva came to Lord Vishnu and the Lord Vishnu pretty much said, why do you give such powers to such people who will use them in the wrong way? So demons worship Lord Shiva for power 
And if they perform the act right, they get the benediction. But this is something that he does because of the role he plays as a, as a demigod. Just like Brahma was worshipped by Hirani Kashipu. And then after the Lord killed him, the Lord chastised Brahma for giving out such benedictions to demons. But that's what the demigods do. They give out benedictions based on the nature of the worship that people perform. So the demigods are worshipped by saintly persons and by by the demons also, especially the demons, because saintly persons usually worship the supreme personality of Godhead. Um, there are many, many wonderful stories of how, how Lord Shiva benedicts his devotee. There's a place in, in the area of um, Manasi Ganga. It's right on the outskirt of Manasi Ganga, where... Of course, this is the place where uh, this lake was created by Krishna as a gift to Srimati Radharani. So this uh, Manasi Ganga was there and Sanatana Goswami had made a bhajan kutir right at the outskirt of Manasi Ganga. And every day he was doing his bhaja and he was also writing. But one of the problems was that there were mosquitoes there and it was becoming a, uh, a disturbance. Sanatan Goswami wasn't able to do his work because he was being bothered by the mosquitoes. And so he made a, uh, a decision that he, the next day he would leave. Now, right near there is a place called Chakaleshwara Mahadev. There are eight, eight lingas of um, Lord Shiva. And when Lord Shiva was very much appreciating the association of Sanatana Goswami, Sanat Goswami being not, not only a pure devotee, but an exemplary pure devotee. And so when Lord Shiva understood that Sanatana Goswami was planning to leave, he appeared to Sanatana Goswami in a, in, a, in a guise of a brahmana. And he said, my dear Sanatan, you know, by having you here, you are benedicting this whole area. And many, many, of many, many personalities are feeling the benedictions that, that you, have, you bring by your presence. So please do not leave. And I assure you, that you will not be bothered by mosquitoes anymore. So Sanatana Goswami agreed and uh, he uh, stayed. And then after that, there were no more mosquitoes in that area in Manasi Ganga there. There's no mosquitoes even to this day because what Shiva did, he went, he went to one particular demigod who supervises mosquitoes. Demigods are in charge of all aspects of material creation and all living entities also. So he told the demigod who's in charge of taking care of mosquitoes, uh, keep your mosquitoes away from Sanatana Goswami. And so into this day that is there, that place you can still go to and there is no mosquitoes. Hmm. Lord Shiva became somewhat, there's a beautiful uh, chapter in the fourth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, where Lord Shiva glorifies the Supreme Personality of God, Lord Vishnu. It's the fourth canto, 24th chapter. There's about 78 verses in that chapter so anyone really wants to go deeper into the mood of Lord Shiva's bhakti, you can see his worship for Lord Vishnu and also Lord Krishna. Of course, many people say that he focuses his main form of worship on Lord Ram, Ramachandra. And the story of how 
um, when after the battle of Kurukshetra, when uh, Ravana was defeated, um, Lord Ram knew that Ravana was a devotee of Lord Shiva. So Ram wanted to honor Lord Shiva because he had killed his devotee. And therefore he arranged for two Shiva Lingas to come in order for the worship. And that's an interesting story, which I'll tell. But some persons who read these pastimes turn things around. That's why you have to understand things from the Acharyas and not simply speculate. Even when Srila Prabhupada would speak or when he would write his purports, people would misunderstand. Sometimes the great soul is not so easy to understand unless they, well, unless one asks questions based on what they don't understand. So there are people who say that Ram, because he worshiped Lord Shiva by worshiping Shiva Linga, he, Shiva, is, Ram is a devotee of Shiva, but that is not right. Shiva is the devotee of Ram. But for the sake of honoring Lord Shiva, because he had killed Ravana, the Lord performed that worship. And I'll tell that story because it's interesting. Um, he told Hanuman to go to Kailash and get a Shiva Linga and bring it back in order for him to worship. So Hanuman left, but he was gone for a long time. The Brahmanas who were performing the sacrifice told Ram that, well, you know, we can't wait any longer because the auspicious time for the worship has appeared. If we wait any longer, it'll become inauspicious. So Ram was thinking what to do. So Sita came forward and said, I will make a Shiva Linga. So with her own hands, she formed this beautiful Shiva Linga out of sand. And while Ram worshiped that and performed the ceremony. At the end of the ceremony, after it was all done, Hanuman had returned with two Shiva Lingas. And when Hanuman saw that the ceremony was over, he felt really unhappy. He wasn't able to serve nicely and the, and the ceremony was over. And Ram realizing how unhappy uh, Hanuman was, he told him that, and there's a temple today, you can go, it's in Rameshwaram. There are two Shiva Lingas there. Uh, one is the one that Hanuman brought back, and people worship that one. And the other one is the one that Sita made, and that is also there, and that's there on an altar. The one that Hanuman made, brought back is right near the door of the, of the temple, and so people can easily come and take darshan. But the other one is on the altar, that's the one that Sita made. That's a beautiful, I've been to that temple and I've seen um, both lingas. You can't get really too close to Sita's linga because they keep at it at a distance in the altar because they're, for whatever reason, I'm not sure. These are some pastimes of Lord Shiva and his relationship. Um, when, I'll just backtrack a little bit, when um, when Ram was fighting against uh, Ravana and Ravana, Ravana was being defeated by Ram, Parvati said to Shiva, why don't you go and help your devotees in trouble? And Shiva said, in this case, it is not possible because he is, a, he is actually a devotee of Lord Ram. Uh, there's one beautiful, it's a kind of a song. It's, we sing it sometimes. It's, a, it's not so well known, but it goes like this. Brahma bole, 
Chatur Mukhe, Krishna Krishna Hare Hare, Mahadeva Panchamukhe, Rama Rama Hare Hare. So in that it says that Lord Brahma, he chants, we has got forehead, Chakra Mukhi, he worships the Lord as Krishna and Ram is worshiped by Lord Shiva, like that, Pancham, Panchamukhi. Lord Shiva sometimes is known as Panchamukhi. There's a beautiful deity, I think it's in Kurukshetra. It's a five-headed uh, form of, of Lord Shiva, like that. She was a very interesting personality. And you'll never be able to really fully understand him as people misunderstand his position because he serves both the demigods and the demons according to their nature of worship as the demigod. But he is a Vaishnava. He is a Vaishnava. Um, he became fascinated or interested, we might say, of the um, worship of Lord Krishna in Vrindavan as the gopis. So he wanted to see what it was like to worship Krishna in Vrindavan and take part in that worship, as particularly Krishna's pastimes as the rasa dance. So Lord Shiva came into Vrindavan and he wanted to participate in the Rasa dance. He was met by Lalita, Radharani's prime girlfriend, Lalita. And she said, no men allowed <laughs> in this particular pastime. There's only one male, and that's Krishna. But he prayed, and therefore she said, all right, if you want to take part in this pastime, you have to become a gopi. So he said, fine, I'll become a gopi. So she took him to one place. It's a kunda. She said, you immerse yourself in the water of this kunda. And when you come out, you'll have a gopi's body. So he did. He went into the water and came out. And there he was, Shiva, now in a female form. But he still had his little crescent moon on his head. Sometimes he's called Gopeshwara Mahadev. <laughs> uh, so when he wanted to take part in the Rasa dance as this gopi, <laughs> Krishna saw this gopi and said, who's that? Because <laughs> he could see the little crescent moon on his forehead. And then he understood it was Lord Shiva. And he said, Shiva, this is not for you. <laughs> so he told him, but because you want to take part in this pastime, I give you the service of Dikpala. Dikpala means the guardian of the directions. So you guard the Rasa dance so there will be no intruders into this Leela. And so he, he actually uh, took part in guarding the Rasa dance like that. Hmm. There's an interesting story, which we don't hear too much. And um, it takes place in a place called Terra Kadamba. And uh, this pastime is that when Lord Shiva heard that Lord Krishna had taken birth in that area, Nandagram, of course, he took birth in, in uh, Gokula and later lived in Nandagram. Oh, he took, I'm sorry, he took birth in Nandagram, later he took birth in, and lived in Goku. Uh, Shiva wanted to see <laughs> this personality. So, you know, Shiva, you know, he's not like the most, uh, what we say, uh, normal addresser. He dresses a little different. He carries snakes around his neck. He has crematory ashes around his body. And he looks a lot different than anybody. <laughs> so he knocked on the door of um, Krishna's house, and Mother Yasoda opened it. And when she saw this personality, she freaked out. 
<laughs> she freaked out, closed the door real quickly and started chanting mantras for protection. At the same time, Krishna, knowing that his devotee Shiva came to see him as a little baby, started to cry and cry and cry. And so now Mother Yasoda was thinking, oh, because of this person came, he scared my baby, now he's crying. And Krishna would not stop crying. And Krishna was crying not because he was in any way afraid, but because he wanted to see his devotee. And so... Uh, um, Mother Yasoda was now worried. Krishna was crying, crying, crying. So he didn't, she didn't know what to do. So uh, she started to inquire from the other gopis what to do. And then um, Purnamasi, who is, organizes Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan, she's actually yoga maya. She took, a, she took her form as a gopi. And she said, well, actually, um, that person came and he put a spell on Krishna. And now the only way you're going to um, get rid of that spell is that you have to invite that person back to come and see Krishna. Oh, <laughs> she was not so interested in that. But Purnamasi is respected. She's elderly and gives direction to Krishna's Leelas. So Mother Yasoda was influenced and she said, okay. So Shiva didn't go far away. He stayed in the area. And then when he, he was told that he could return, so he went back and he knocked on the door again. And Mother Yasoda, she opened the door again. She became frightened, but then she knew that she was supposed to bring this personality to see her little baby. So she did. And as soon as Shiva came and saw Krishna, um, Krishna stopped crying. And Krishna was very happy to see his devotee and uh, Shiva was very happy to take the darshan of baby Krishna. And then very, as soon as that's over, Mother is so, was very enthusiastic to make sure that he left as soon as possible. <laughs> So that place is, there is called, uh, um, hmm. I can't remember the name, but it's the name. What is the Sanskrit word for compassion? Not Karuna, there's another name. Asha? Asha, something like Asha. Adra. It's the place where, no, not there's no T in it. Asha. Daya Prabhuji. No. It's the place where Lord Shiva found satisfaction by seeing Lord Krishna. So. Anyway, um, and then, of course, that place is still there today. You can go and see the place where Lord Shiva took portion of Lord Krishna. That's an interesting pastime. Uh, Lord Shiva, Lord Vishnu, Lord Narayan, and ultimately Lord Krishna. And we also say Lord Brahma. So Lord Brahma and us, the living entities in the material world, in our spiritual existence, we have 78% of the qualities of uh, Lord Krishna. And Lord Shiva has 84% of the qualities of Lord Krishna. Krishna. He's, so he's greater than Lord Brahma. Lord Orion has 96% of the qualities of Krishna. And Krishna has five particular qualities that are unique to himself. 
that no other manifestation of Godhead has. And that's mentioned in the Nectar of Devotion. He's surrounded by his loving devotees. He takes part in his pastimes in Sri Vrindavan Dham. There's five particular qualities that Krishna has mentioned in the Nectar of Devotion. One time Shiva was in ecstasy and he was singing and singing and singing and, and he was dancing and dancing and dancing and just yelling out the name, Goranga, Goranga, Goranga. So uh, Parvati, she was thinking, What's, what about my husband? He said, I never saw him like this. He's so and much in ecstasy is nobody around and he's just chanting this name Goranga. I never heard of this name Goranga and he's in dancing. So she approached my dear, you know, Prabhu. I can see you are in so many, so much happiness. Please tell me you're chanting this name Goranga. So who is Goranga? And then she, she said, I'm your wife. So please share with me. Oh, okay. Well, actually, soon, after some time in the area of a place called Shimantadweep, a personality will appear, and his name will be Lord Chaitanya, and he will be known as Goranga. He is being the most magnanimous, most merciful incarnation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna himself, in the mood of his own pure devotee. When she heard that, she became really interested. So she performed austerities and penances and then wound up in the area of Navadweep to see who is this Goranga. So she went there and prayed and prayed and prayed. And after praying for some time and performing austerities, Lord Chaitanya appeared to her <laughs> and told her, when she saw Lord Chaitanya, she bowed down. And I'll tell you that part in a minute. The Lord had told her, he said, I will be appearing in the age of Kali Yuga to teach the ultimate religious principle of worshiping the Supreme Personality of Godhead through chanting his holy names. Parvati was in a mood of complete submission and humility after seeing Garanga and she offered her obeisances. And she took the dust from his lotus feet and placed it in the section of her hair where the, where the women part their hair in the middle. That's called the Srimanta, where the women part their hair in the middle. That's called Srimanta. And so she took the dust and put it there. So that area is called Srimantadweep. And that's where um, Lord Shiva is also worshipped in Srimantadweep. In our Jagannath temple nearby, there's a place in the hollow of a tree. There's a beautiful Shiva Linga there, really big Shiva Linga. The hollow of the tree is also huge. And it is worshipped regularly by devotees and others like that. So this is some more about Lord Shiva. Uh, and there is a, a course on this day in that the devotees in Mayapur, they come to that area of Sri Mantadweep and they perform at least a four or five hour ceremony in honor of Lord Shiva. I have been fortunate Practically every year when I'm in Mayapur, I get the chance to take part in that ceremony. We usually speak the glories of Lord Shiva. And then we perform Krishna Kirtan. And then uh, there are many speakers, usually Janani Vas Prabhu comes or Pankajangri comes. And Nishringa Maharaj comes. Bhakti Chaitanya Maharaj comes. And... Um, who else? Um, what's his name? Can't think of his name right now. But he also comes regularly in other sannyasi. And then in the closing part of the ceremony, we take that Shiva Linga and place it on a huge platform. 
And then we, with, with many, many garlands and various types of uh, flower arrangements, tosi leaves, and uh, we do Abhishek, pouring various substances on the deity, different types of fruit juices and milk products like that. So it's a nice ceremony that we honor Lord Shiva. And Prabhupada said, we honor Lord Shiva in order to glorify Lord Krishna. It helps us to become more Krishna conscious. There's no formal worships that we take part in our temples. In our temples, we simply uh, have uh, Prabhacha on the glories of Lord Shiva. <clears throat> Lord Shiva also has, has another particular interesting position. <clears throat> As we mentioned, he takes part in the creation, assisting Lord Maha, uh, Mahavishnu. So he's also called the father of all living entities. And he's also known as, he has the same power that the super soul has. There are three entities that know everything about all living entities. One is Krishna in the heart. Two is Yamaraj, because he has to judge the sinful. Yamaraj has that special power to know the, the pious and sinful activities of all the living entities. And Lord Shiva is the third. These three are similar to the super soul. They, sometimes Shiva is called the second super soul. These are some of the few of the many, many wonderful stories about Lord Shiva and his position. Of course, we have that wonderful section in the Srimad Bhagavatam in the fourth canto when Daksha comes in. And there's a ceremony going on, a great sacrifice. Lord Shiva is present, Brahma is present, many of the chief demigods are also present. The sacrifice is a, a big sacrifice. Daksha being one of the prime progenitors and also very qualified, was one of the guests at the sacrifice. And he was such a powerful person, Daksha, that when he walked in, everyone stood up to welcome Daksha's appearance, except one person, Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva was in meditation, and therefore he didn't even notice Daksha. Daksha had a tendency to become a little proud because of his glories. He was glorious in so many ways, but he developed some pride based on that. So when he saw that Lord Shiva didn't honor him, he started to find fault with Lord Shiva. And uh, we also know that he was married, Shiva was married to Sati. Sati is the manifestation of his concert before she became Parvati. Shiva was Shiva Sati before it was Shiva Parvati. So in that manifestation of Sati, she was the daughter. Daksha had 16 daughters and one of them was Sati. She was the 13th of the 16 daughters and she had married Lord Shiva. And so how did she marry Lord Shiva? She married Lord Shiva because you have to get permission for your, from your father for a girl to marry a particular person. So Brahma wanted Sati to marry Lord Shiva, knowing their eternal relationship. So he told Daksha that you marry Sati to Shiva. Daksha didn't want to do it, but because Brahma is his father, he obeyed his father and married his daughter Sati to Shiva. Therefore, he had a little bit of a grudge against Shiva. And then when this situation happened, he became offended because he was not given the honor like everyone else did. And he started finding fault with Shiva. Shiva didn't even, didn't even pay attention to him. He found him, you know, he was just criticizing Lord Shiva. You know, you, you associate with lower class people. You wear snakes, you smear your body with crematorium ashes. And so many ways he found fault. You know, Shiva, after some time, he didn't respond at all. 
and you just got up and left the ceremony. But that criticism caused a division in the assembly and some people were angry at Daksha and others were supporting Daksha. So because of that, the whole thing turned into a disruption and the whole sacrifice was stopped. <laughs> and then later on, after some time, another sacrifice was organized and Sati again wanted to go to be part of that sacrifice. Shiva, he, was, he didn't want to go because he knew Daksha was there and Daksha would again find fault. So he decided not to go and he told Sati, because Sati wanted to go because she was attracted to the idea of family members and uh, association. So he told her, you know, it's not a good idea. You go because, you know, your father will find fault with me and this will be worse than death for you. But Prabhupada says because she had that social mood, she wanted to go anyways to associate with her mother, her friends and all she went. And then as soon as she got there, Daksha just let loose on his daughter, criticizing Lord Shiva. She became so unhappy that she sat down in mystic meditation and uh, in, invoking the fire within her body, she burnt up her body right in front of her father. And her father didn't even say anything. He acted like it wasn't something. Everyone was shocked. And when Shiva found out what had happened, and then he created a, a monster, and that monster came in and attacked the whole assembly house, and then there was a great fight. <laughs> and uh, Daksha lost his head during that fight, and he was given a head of a goat. You can see the picture, Daksha with a head of a goat. Uh, uh, Prabhupada said, mm -hmm. Mm, they could cut off somebody's head and replace it with another head and the, the life would still be there. So, of course, you know, the scientists might think they could try and do that. But if they asked you to volunteer for that experiment, I wouldn't trust them because I'm sure they can't do it. <laughs> if you want a different head, then you have to get a different body. So don't worry about trying to improve by changing heads in this particular manifestation of your sojourn in the material world. So this is, uh, this is Lord Shiva. And of course, um, Daksha apologized to Lord Shiva. And uh, he was freed from the offense, but he had to take another birth. He, he lied. And he was reborn again as the son of Lord Brahma because he's a progenitor and he has a big service in, in helping to populate the universe during the beginning of each of the manifestations. Now that's an interesting story. If you read those pages, seven chapters, the first seven chapters in the seven, first seven chapters in the, in the fourth canto, all about Daksha Yagya, it's called. There are many, many other pastimes uh, with Lord Shiva, uh, the story of Banasura. That's a, that's a beautiful pastime. Shiva also is also he is one of the, he is the original proponent of Hatha Yoga. Anyone who wants to really learn what Hatha Yoga is, there is a book called the Shiva Samhita. And there are 8,400,000 asanas that Shiva teaches. <laughs> He's also, when he uh, wants to, not when he wants to, when it's time for the annihilation of the universe, he performs that function by dancing his famous uh, dance of pralaya. I'm, I forgot, it's called, it starts with a K. It's a particular dance that Shiva does. Uh, I don't know, what, what is that dance called? The Tandava dance. 
Thanda. 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 Yeah, Thanda. Thanda dance. There's a beautiful temple in, um, I mean, really beautiful temple in, um, where is it? It's in Maharashtra in a place called um, Satara, in that area of Satara and Maharashtra. For those of you who are familiar with that area, it's a huge compound. And in the middle, there is a Shiva temple. And all around the temple, there are dioramas of Shiva dancing in his tanda dance. I remember when I came there one year, the, the, the temple uh, uh, custodians, um, they were fascinated by me um, for whatever reason, I don't know. So they, and I came on Shivaratri too. So they asked me to give a lecture on Lord Shiva, so I did. And in that particular temple, Shiva is not worshiped as a linga, he's worshiped as his form of Shiva dancing. When he dances with his one leg up and the other leg on top of the little demon there and his arms in a particular posture. So there's a there's a deity of Shiva in that form there. And right before the form, a little distance away is uh, the Nandi, Nandi, the bull carrier of Shiva. He's also there. Nandi is worshipped also, but he's not worshipped on the same altar as Shiva. They keep Nandi in front of Shiva, looking towards the altar at a distance away. And that is the form of worship like that. So that was nice. I spent much time at that temple. I went there many, many times. It's a good place for chanting Japa. And there's many other smaller temples in that same compound. There's also a temple of Krishna there too. Um, I can't remember the actual name of the temple, but it's if you go to Satara, I think everybody knows about that particular temple. Um, Trambakeshwar. Uh, what is it? Trambakeshwar. Could, yeah, I think so. That's it. Yeah. yeah. You've been there? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. And right around the temple, within the compound, there's a big area where you can walk around. Is that the place? Yes, Maharaj. <clears throat> big, yes, big no. area. Big, big area there. There's also a little place where they worship uh, Hanuman, I think. Also, there's many nice temples in that little area. <laughs> so, um, okay, so we spent some time speaking about Lord Shiva. There's much more we could say, but in uh, in Mayapur, he is Vrida Shiva, and his consort is Pro Proto Maya. There, so she is the uh, personification of the material energy called Proto Maya. Like that, she was known for his drinking of the ocean of poison. Therefore, he he saved the universe from devastation. We know that from the pastime of the eighth canto, how when the demigods and demons were churning the ocean of milk, what came out first was the poison, and that poison was deadly, and it was going to destroy everything, and everyone was concerned. So they asked Shiva if they could, he could solve the problem, and he took some of that poison and drank it, but Lord, but Parvati held his neck so he wouldn't swallow it. And therefore, on his neck, there's a mark. And therefore, he's called Nilakanta. Or sometimes he's called Kalakanta, like that. And he dropped a lot of that poison on the ground. And many insects took that poison. And those insects were, became poisonous spiders, scorpions, and other 
poisonous type insects like that. But that's that's all there in the eighth canto of him performing that pastime. He has his own abode, which is separate from the material world and separate from the spiritual world. In the Brahma Samhitas is a beautiful prayer. Goloka Nami Nijatami Tale Tatasyam Devi Mahesha Haridama Sute Shute Su Te Te Vrabhava Nichaya Vitas Chayena Govinda Mari Purusham Tamaham Bajami Lowest of all, Devi Dam. Next above is Maheshtam. Above Maheshtam is a place called Harida. The abode of Hari, and above them is located, and above them all is located Krishna's own realm named Gokul. I adore the primeval Lord Govinda, who has allotted their respective authorities to the rulers of those created realms. So there's three levels of existence: the material world, the spiritual world, and the world of Lord Shiva, which is called Maheshtam. It's in between. If you travel outside the material universes, you go through the different coverings on the material universes. And it's very difficult to get through there unless you are a mystic yogi. Once you get out, there is an area of darkness. It's complete darkness and you travel for, I don't know how long, millions of years in that darkness going upward. Finally, you come to an area of complete light and in that area of complete light is Maheshtam. So the light from the Brahma Jyoti coming from the spiritual world lights up that area, and that's the area where Lord Shiva resides. It's called Maheshtam. Sometimes we call it Kailash. So many devotees, before they actually became worshippers of Lord. Krishna used to worship Lord Shiva. And if you worship Lord Shiva as, not as a demigod for material benedictions, but if you worship him as a devotee, then he brings you to Lord Krishna. And we find that this is a very common affair that so many devotees in our movement were followers of Lord Shiva in one form or another. We might not say in the exact way to follow, but there was a strong attraction and some type of uh, worship of Lord Shiva. And then he will bring one to Krishna right there. So Prabhupada says, yeah, because he is Vaishnavaram Yata Shambhu, we worship Lord Shiva as the greatest of all Vaishnavas. And that story of him drinking the Poison in the ocean of milk churning is the illustration of his compassion. He saved the whole universe from being destroyed and all the living entities within it. Like that. So Lord Shiva is very kind by nature. And it's not very difficult to please Lord Shiva for worship. If you offer nice prayers to Lord Shiva with some bale leaf, he, he likes bale leaves then that worship is complete. But we don't worship material. Some people worship Lord Shiva to get material benedictions, but we worship Lord Shiva to help us in our uh, practice of Krishna consciousness by helping us become more and more devoted to Lord Krishna. We can take his help in that way. When Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was traveling in South India for six years, leaving Jagannath Puri and going down the, uh, the eastern side of India and then going all the way down to Cape Comorum and coming back up the western side. When he was in the South India, in South India a lot, he visited so many Shiva temples. He visited Shiva temples, he visited Vishnu temples, and a few of the other temples that were by a few uh, personalities also. The Lord Shiva showed that, you know, we should, I mean, Lord Krishna showed, um, I'm sorry, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu showed that we should give complete respect and honor 
to Lord Shiva. But for the sake of worship, we worship Krishna. Krishna is our worshipful deity. Shiva, we honor him as the greatest of all devotees. Like that. And, uh, so on this day, Shivaratri is very auspicious. Actually, I was informed by someone who was quite authoritative that Shivaratri happens every month. There is one day in every month where Shiva is worshipped. Uh, it's called Shivaratri. But once a year, there is Maha Shivaratri, and that is the day we are presently here. So this is Maha Shivaratri, and then once a month, every month of the year, there is Shivaratri. If you happen to go to Sri Mayapur, please visit our temple in Sri Mantadweep, where Jagannath is being worshipped in a beautiful form there. And you'll see within the same compound, there's that tree and a huge Shivalinga there. The conclusion of Shiva Ratri is that everyone becomes Krishna conscious. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for such a beautiful, beautiful class and uh, making us understanding understand how we have to observe uh, on this day or for uh, Hivaratri, what, what should be our mood and very, very nice pastimes, uh, Maharaj that you shared how Lord Shiva went to visit uh, visit Lord Krishna and how he was became as a gatekeeper for Ras, uh, um, Rasa Leela and also the, many pastimes, Maharaj, such a beautiful, beautiful class. Thank you so much uh, for your association, Maharaj. Very, very grateful to you. Thank you so much. Is there anybody having any questions for Maharaj? Please go ahead, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Mataji, there is a question in the chat box. Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you so much uh, for your wonderful class. You mentioned Lord Shiva within the material world is a post as opposed to the eternal position of Sada Shiva. How does it work as a word, word post indicates it might be filled by an ordinary Jiva as with Lord Brahma? Well, I forgot, it takes so many hundreds and hundreds of births with so many austerities to achieve the post of Lord Shiva. And that's mentioned. One can attain the post of Brahma by worshiping, I can't, there's a particular type of worship that's mentioned in the Shastras. But it's a post. Every universe has a Shiva in it. But then there's the Sadashiva who has his planet in the Vaikuntha realm. He is the uh, source of all the other Shivas. Yeah. So that's described like that. So what, the, what was the question specifically? What was the question again? Okay. Um, Lord Shiva, within the material world, is, is a post as post with the eternal position of Sada Shiva. How does it work as a word post indicates it might be filled by an ordinary Jiva as with, as with Lord Brahma? Mm. Yeah, it, could, it seems to indicate that. That could be that a jiva can attain that situation. But I think there's more to it than that, that one would have to appear again. Um, 
it's a little, this one's a little bit mysterious for me to sort out. But we hear that it's a post. So that much I know, it's a post. <laughs> because as every universe has a Lord Brahma, every universe has a Lord Shiva also. So there are different, there's three different categories of Lord Brahma. There may also be categories of Lord Shiva. And that's a possibility, different types of, there's different types of, it's just like there are, there's different types of gopis. There's, there's personalities who become gopis and then there's those who are eternally gopis also. That may also apply to Lord Shiva. Of course, no one can take the position of Sadashi, but that's the original Shiva. But Vishnu, when he wants to do the work of destruction, he becomes Lord Shiva. That's as much as I can respond to that particular question. You'd have to go further and get the answers on that one. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you. Is there anybody having any more questions for Maharaj? Please go ahead. There must be a few Shiva fans out there. Guru Maharaj, please my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Glories to you, Guru Maharaj. All glories to this wonderful narration of Lord Shiva's pastimes and his activities. It was revealing and uh, totally absorbing. My question is about this Tandav Nitya when uh, the time of annihilation comes and Lord Shiva performs the act of destruction. What happens to Lord Shiva himself uh, after this act of destruction? <laughs> you have to ask him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he he's not affected by his activities. He dances, he plays his drum called the Din Din drum. And it's a dance of Pralaya. Pralaya means destruction. Shiva has, you know, very sweet nature and he also has his expansions as Shiva as Rudra. Rudra is his fiery expansions for the sake of destruction. So Shiva expands into different forms of himself. There are 11 Rudras too. And that's mentioned in the third canto, I believe in the 12th chapter of the third canto, somewhere in that area. It mentions the 11 Rudras and what their different names are. So is when he ex when he does that dance, he expands his rudra. Okay, thank you, Guru Maharaj. Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Our glory is to Srila Prabhupada and our glory is to you. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, nice, nice class. Um, I would like to ask you about um, many, many years ago, I, I've heard the past time about uh, Lord Shiva. Uh, and I, I, I'm not sure if I remember correctly, but uh, it was about uh, when uh, he and, uh, and Lord Vishnu had some kind of dance when uh, half of they they uh, merged merged somehow. Uh, so, do you know anything about that pastime? Maybe that there's a deity of that. It's in Mayapur. It's called Harihara. Harihara. 
and the deity is divided into two colors. One side of the one side of the front is black, and the other side is white. The black side is is uh, Krishna, and the other side is Shiva. Shiva is the white side. <laughs> And is, is there any story uh, past time connected to this form? Yeah, there is. <laughs> but I don't know it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, even though because I, I was confused if I remembered it correctly, because sometimes I see pictures of uh, Lord Shiva, half Lord Shiva and half uh, Parvati. So I, I was wondering that maybe I don't remember well. But uh, there's no picture half Parvati and half Shiva. Uh, well, I'm not sure if it's speculation or not because it's just uh, uh, images on in the internet. It's it's half half Shiva and half Vishnu, or half mm -hmm. Shiva and half Krishna, not Parvati. There may be a manifestation of Shiva and Parvati in one form, but I've never seen it. What is it called? When someone said, Guru Maharaj, there is, a, there is this deity form of half uh, woman, half uh, man, like this, of Lord Shiva and Parvati. It is there in, uh, uh, ma in the caves just off the Bombay Harbor. If you cross from that, uh, what is that, gateway of India, and you take a cruise boat to that, uh, I forget the name of that little island over there. There in the mountain caves, there is this uh, form of Adha Narishwa. Elephant Island, Martin. Yes, 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 that's right. Thank you. Elephant It's called, what is the name of that? Andi. Adha Narishwa. Andi Can you post it again? You posted it once. Just put that post back up again. Our uh, our Nishwar. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting. Yeah, she was also connected a lot with um, Arissa there in the area of Bhuvaneshwara. There's a lot of pastimes of Lord Shiva and Bhuvaneshwar. In fact, that's another name for, for Shiva is Bhuvaneshwar. Thank you, Maharaj. There is uh, Rupraj Mah Prabhu uh, is uh, uh, raising his hand. Rupraj Prabhu, please go ahead and ask your question. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, this is Ruparaju. Uh, I had two questions. One is, uh, uh, I don't know, somewhere uh, uh, I heard that there is no difference between Hari Hara and whoever shows the difference between Hari and Hara, they they will not be um, qualified as a devotee. And the other question is, uh, like when Krishna was born, um, to, uh, like when he's uh, done the pastimes with Eshoda Mata in the Damodar Leela and all, uh, Eshoda Mata recites some Lord, uh, some some Lord's names, right? So is that Lord Shiva's name, or uh, is Shiva at that time present, or what is the origin of Shiva? When is he actually present? In which Leela? Or... Oh, he's there. He's in Ram Leela. He's also in Krishna Leela. He's in both so what is the difference then? Between? Like, why people say there is no difference between Lord Shiva and Lord... Uh, Vishnu. Hari, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, because when I mentioned that, when Shiva, when Vishnu wants to take the, do the work of destruction, he takes the form of Lord Shiva. Because Vishnu doesn't touch the material energy, but Shiva does. That's why sometimes he becomes affected by that contact. Where Brahma also becomes affected by that contact. When he does creation, Shiva, when he does destruction. 
but it's Vishnu who manifests himself in these forms for the sake of creation, maintenance, and destruction. That's mentioned in the Bhagavatam in different places. And so there is a particular deity called Hari, Harihara, which are both forms of Vishnu and Shiva in one form like that. That's why they say there's no difference. But uh, when we say there's no difference, there is difference and no difference and that's simultaneously. That's the, that's the position of uh, Beta Beta Tattva, that something can be different and non-different simultaneously. I'll give you the example they use in relationship to Shiva, which is the verse from the Brahma Samhita. If you take milk and you add a little culture to it, you get yogurt. So what is yogurt? It's nothing but milk, but you can't use yogurt like milk. But it's nothing but milk, that's all it is. So in the same way, the difference between Shiva and Vishnu is simply a, a function, that's all. Hmm. Yeah. But why Yashoda Mata is uh, reciting some other um, some other mantras? I think she used to recite. Uh... Yeah, in fact, when when Krishna got attacked in, in Vrindavan by uh, Putana, they. Uh, all the ladies, after Putana was killed by Krishna, all the ladies grabbed Krishna and they all start giving, chanting different mantras for their protection. So Prabhupada says that that, that was the culture in, um, in Vedic times, what they would recite different mantras to different deities for different benedictions. That was a common thing. And Prabhupada said, you know, because, you know, the cultivated culture is lost now, so nobody does any of that anymore. But generally, that's the, that's, that's the tradition. Just like uh, I, anything, anything you want, anything, there is a particular prayer that you can recite to a deity that's in connection with that desire. Anything. They're like, just give you, and I give you an example. Um, we had an earthquake not long ago, on December 29th last year, a pretty big earthquake. I'm, I'm about 150 miles away from where it was, 120 miles away from where it was. I felt it also. And people who were right there, I knew many devotees who were right in this situation. They were quite shaken up by the whole thing. So I told that to a few people and one devotee I know, he's just, he knows Shastra really good. He knows all mantras good. He studies the Vedas. He sent me a mantra that you can pray for protection of your area. In other words, sometimes people pray to protect my, you know, area, protect my home, protect my, uh, and there's protecting your ears, protecting your head, protecting your back, protecting your front, protecting your thighs, protecting your chest. There's all deities and mantras all recited for protection on different levels. Or if you want material benefits, if you want money, you can worship in a certain way. If you want a good wife, you worship in a certain way. If you want to become famous, you worship in a certain way. Yeah, all material desires, there's, there's, there are worships connected to it. So anything, anything on any level, there is prayers and mantras that one can chant. Because devotees don't do that because we simply worship the Lord and we depend on him. So whatever he gives us, we're satisfied with and whatever he doesn't give us, we don't want. Just like Prayer, there's a prayer to Hanuman if you lose something. And I've used it a few times and it works. So if, if you can't find something and you've lost it 
and you know you don't know where it is, you pray, you, you chant this mantra to Hanuman, and you'll find it. If you do it in the right way. It's a simple mantra. You chant it three times, you face the north, and you meditate on Hanuman while you're chanting it. So anything, anything you want is there in the Vedas. <laughs> Everything, it's all included. Nowadays, people just do things to try to get what they want. But in Vedic times, people understood the power of mantra, the power of prayer, power of sacrifice. So everything was done in relationship to the higher powers and not simply by one's own endeavor. One wants a nice child, they can pray, they can chant certain mantras and pray like that. One wants an, a boy, they can chant that, they can chant if you want a girl. There's so many, I mean, everything is there in the Vedas. <laughs> it's, it's unlimited. <laughs> but as far as devotees are concerned, we're not interested so much. Because we just simply depend on Krishna. That. And we're happy whatever he provides. But I'm, I'm just letting you know that the ladies in Vrindavan, when Krishna was attacked and after they saw that Krishna was saved, they were worried that he would be attacked again. So they start chanting all these mantras to all these different deities for protection for Krishna. And it's a whole list. You can go into the, uh, I think it's the sixth chapter of the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, the killing of Putana. And towards the end of the chapter, you'll see verses of all the prayers that they that they offered to these different deities. And my question is, uh, during those prayers, did any of the gopikas or um, any members there have recited something about Shiva at that time? I didn't see anything in those prayers. Oh, I said they were more or less different manifestations of Vishnu. So in Krishna, uh, in Krishna's uh, leelas, there is no reference to Shiva, right? Uh, no, I, I'm sure there is, but I'd have to do a little research because Shiva is also known like that. There's, a, I told that one story how Shiva came to see Lord Krishna when he was a little baby, and Mother Yasoda became alarmed when she saw the form of Shiva. And that's that. Pet I just told that pastime as part of this program, but. There I am. Shiva was also, yeah. I heard a story that when when he did Mohini Avatara, that's when uh, Lord Shiva came. But I don't know from what is the relation between Shiva and Krishna at that time, though. That was, she was in certain, she was, you know, before that. It's not like she, she appeared at the beginning of creation. He, it's mentioned that he appears from the anger of Lord Bar Brahma. That's how he appeared. But although he appeared from the anger of Lord Brahma, he's more powerful than Lord Brahma. And is the is it correct, uh, Guru Maharaj? The people say the Omkaram originated uh, from Shiva Tattva, according to Shiva Purana. Is that true? Mm, I've never heard it. Omkara is simply an indication of Krishna. There's no there's no there's no connection with Shiva with Omkara. Shiva might have chanted that, but it's not that that Omkar indicates Shiva, it indicates Krishna. <laughs> okay, Guru Maharaj. Yeah. yeah Thank you for clarifying all the questions. Yeah, that's mentioned in the Bhagavad Gita. Omkar is non different than Krishna. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj, for beautiful, beautiful class and nice question. Maharaj, do you have time for more questions or we? Um, let's see. Hmm. Uh, is there more questions? Yeah. Is there anybody having any more questions for Maharaj? Please go ahead. Hare Krishna, dear Maharaj. Done with Pranam all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, Mamta. Maharaj, I have a question related to how um, you were talking about Shiva and Rudra. It was a very beautiful class. 
and i just had a question coming up in my mind is it okay if i can ask you yeah okay I'm not so my that shiva because I, as i said shiva is so complex that he's the most difficult person to figure out <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much mahesh but you made it appear everything so uh, nice and easy uh, but uh, you know i had this uh, doubt because uh, one time we heard that uh, one of the rudras is hanuman yeah. so that's so, true okay so maharaj how do we understand that hanuman is also eternal servant of um, shri ram and then he is also one of the rudras which is like a yeah, uh, yeah. Hmm. one in one of the one of the births of um, i think it's the birth of mohini murti Mm-hmm. when mohini murti when when shiva's potency was lost during that particular time that potency was taken and was given to anjana mm. and then anjana is the mother of hanuman mm. and another time she, hanuman appears as keshavi keshavi putra so hanuman appears in different millenniums in different ways So one time he came from Shiva and that's why he's called one of the rudras and there's in Kuru Shaitra you can see that also too you know in one in that in that five headed form of lord shiva one of the heads is hanuman oh okay yeah so yeah that's i that i've heard many times that uh, Hanuman appears in different ways at different times. Mm-hmm. On time from time from Kesari, no, Kesari, yeah, because his mother was Anjana, his father was Kesari. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yes. Thank you, yeah. Maharaj. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, that's yeah. Hari Bol. all glory to you thank you maharaj once more for a beautiful beautiful class and nice question answer session um we can close the call here because it's already 8 o'clock and um i would like to offer my obeisances to you maharaj vancha kalpa daro bsc kripal singh jai 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 वैष्णवृंद की जय 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 जय